here, those who are zooming in, maskies and zoomies, good to see you all. It is 9.30, and uh, this is the Lord's Day, and we are His people, so let's prepare our hearts to worship. And Beth, if you will start the prelude for us, and we will, uh, we will quiet our hearts and turn our attention to the Lord. Thank you. Amen. What a great way to begin our worship service. May the peace of God our Father and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And I welcome you this morning to worship with First Presbyterian Church. As we begin worship, there's just a few announcements this morning, and I'll highlight just a few. Uh, there is a, a class that will be started, I think, tomorrow uh, on racial reconciliation. There's some details in the bulletin, and you may want to be a part of that, and uh, Alan Smith can give you some extra information if you need it, but uh, uh, invite you to be a part of that. Uh, another uh, announcement, the annual reports are due on the 13th. If you are responsible for a portion of our annual reports, um, if you could please uh, have your report in, email it in. Uh, we're trying to have everything in by the 13th, and 
uh, please, if you've got these options, please use Arial as your font and 11 point, and that will save on some of the uh, editing that has to be done after the fact. I tell you, it's going to be wild putting these annual reports together this year, isn't it? I mean, because this is a year like nothing we've ever had, uh, and I, I, I don't know, I, I don't know what it will be like and what the uh, what the uh, uh, meeting will be like. I think we're going, we've got it scheduled later in the month, and it will be online. Um, but uh, it's a wild year. We'll do the best we can to uh, report on it and, and share together and. Pray for the year to come. Also want to let you know that uh, it's about this time of year when the Mosaic churches, the 12 churches, have gotten together and congregations have worshipped together. And that also uh, we can't do because of COVID. Uh, uh, so uh, the, the worship leadership team, the, the Mosaic leadership team is planning a service I think for January the 24th, it's going to be an outdoor service, kind of like a um, uh, an outdoor movie, um, where we'll we'll gather in the Genesee parking lot, and uh, they're going to have a 40-foot screen there, and they're, uh, we'll worship together in our cars on our FM radios. That's how it's going to work this year. So it, it, I think it's going to be kind of fun. It's it's an adjustment to COVID, but I think it's going to be kind of fun. And I'm grateful they, they had expected to be able to use the Genesee to film the video that they are going to use for worship. And that fell through, so they were looking for other beautiful venues in Waukegan where they could shoot the video. And they decided to uh, film the worship video here. So they are recording that on Saturday. Um, the sanctuary will be used for, for putting together this video. There'll be. Uh, songs from the band and and uh, testimonies and uh, scripture read and prayers um, and glenn is doing a good bit of arranging for that uh, worship event so i'm glad that we can share our space and uh, some of our gifts with uh, the the broader mosaic community so that that's coming up later and grateful for that the only other announcement I think I need to highlight today is I am told there are there's some people worshiping in here today. Those of you at home can maybe see this on the, on the camera two angle, but we've got some that are worshiping here. But I think only one who has, actually has a birthday today. And I think that's Neil Johnson. And I'm not gonna say how old he is, but he's 92. And I... Man, it's a, it's a, those little touches are the things that we miss so much during COVID, aren't they? Uh, and I'm glad that we could do a bit of that this morning. Uh, the Lord loves us. The Lord calls to us. The Lord makes us his own. And he has given us this opportunity to come and worship. Our call to worship is from Matthew 11. As Jesus says to you and to me, Jesus says, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. As we worship God, I invite you to join with me in the affirmation of faith and the prayer of confession that you'll find printed in the bulletin. Let every, oops, I'm sorry. Stand for the hymn.
You may be seated. And please join with me in the affirmation of faith printed in the bulletin. Let every tongue confess Jesus Christ is the Lord. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that at the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And let us approach our holy God and admit our need for, for forgiveness for our sins. Please join me in the prayer of confession. Heavenly Father, you are holy in all that you are and all that you do. You have called us into your kingdom through faith in Jesus, our King. We admit that we have broken your commandments and done what is right in our own eyes. Our hearts and minds are filled with much fear and anger and with too little thanksgiving and trust. We have grieved you and hurt others with our words and our actions. Forgive us, Lord, by your great grace. Teach us to live in repentance and faith. Christ, our Lord and Savior, in whose name we pray. Amen. Let us keep a moment of silence and offer to God our individual prayers of confession. The word of scripture is true and certain and comforting. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Brothers and sisters, believe the good news of the gospel through faith in Jesus Christ our sins are forgiven. We have a reading from the Psalter from Psalm 4, and I invite you to join with me as we read God's word responsively, if you respond in the bold type. Psalm 4, answer me when I call, O God of my righteousness. You have given me relief when I was in distress. Be gracious to me and hear my prayer. Amen. Amen. How long shall my honor be turned into shame? How long will you love vain words and seek after lies? But know that the Lord has set apart the godly for himself. The Lord hears when I call to him. Be angry. 
offer right sacrifices and put your trust in the Lord. You have put more joy in my heart than they have when their grain and wine abound. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And Glenn, if you will come and lead us in, in Christ alone, please. All right. Thank you very much, Glenn. Alan, will you please come and lead us in our Bible reading from the New Testament? Today's New Testament reading is from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13 to chapter 5, verse 11. This is found on page 1257 in the Church ESV Bibles. The section is called The Coming of the Lord and then The Day of the Lord. 
But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive who are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Now, concerning the times and the seasons, brothers have no need to have anything written to you. For you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman and they will not escape. But you are not in darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief. For you are all children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night or of the darkness. So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. This is the word of the Lord. Okay, I'm gonna come down. Okay, I invite you to turn with me in your Bibles to Genesis 23. We're going to be back in Genesis today. And I will read this passage in just a moment. Uh, it is a shorter passage in Genesis 23 than, than most of our passages as we're going through Genesis. And I just have a couple of things to show with you. So I, um, I thought that would give me just a, a, a minute or two to reflect with you on the events of the past week. My, my heart has been full as, as yours have. It was a hard week. We've had many hard weeks this, this last year. Um, last week was also a hard week. Um, as we watched what happened in our nation's capital and uh, the uh, the uh, assault on the capital, uh, what was that Wednesday? Was that Wednesday now? Uh, one of the verses that kept coming to my mind through that is from uh, Galatians chapter five, where uh, God inspired Paul to write, "For you were called to freedom, brothers." Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. And it just seems like right now at this point in our history for uh, 
there are so many issues and there's a lot of biting and devouring going on. Our nation is awash in what I can only describe as hot indignation. Um, half the country is yelling at the other half almost all of the time. And there are violent extremists and uh, agitators, rioters, fueling the animosity all around. And it's tricky because we value, we value protests because we value truth and we value freedom. At the same time, we denounce violence and calls for violence because we are called to love our neighbors as ourselves and to love even our enemies. But uh, riotous mobs are not new, sadly. Um, assaults on the Capitol building are new, I think. I don't remember seeing anything quite like that. And it's always a shameful thing when, uh, when people will destroy personal property. Um, but this is the heart of our government, isn't it? And I was thinking about how we live in an age of skepticism and mistrust. And there is an erosion of trust in our institutions, like our government and like church. Consequently, we look for other places to put our trust in ourselves or in other uh, charismatic individuals and trust over much individuals who can disappoint us and trust too little in the truth which stands firm forever. And I don't know what the way forward is for our nation or if there is a way out for us. I just know that God in his wisdom has given us institutions. Uh, institutions like the family and like government and like the church. And so whatever the way forward is, it must involve those institutions that God has given for us that's a part of our life together. The assault on the Capitol feels like an assault on our way of doing government, and I think it is a good and precious way. I love our representative form of government, um, our system that is based upon a constitution on the rule of law, on uh, peaceful transference of power. All of that, I think, reflects a lot of biblical truth. It's a precious gift. And every good and perfect gift comes from above, from the Father. And he requires good stewardship of that gift. And so we pray for these gifts that we have received. We pray for and support the institutions that God has made. We need to do that for our own peace and our own prosperity. And even more, he commands us to love one another. Um, and I'm not sure what all that means, but that passage has been in my mind. I'm grateful for the freedom that we have. I just know that we need God's help to use those freedoms well. So let's pray, and we will attend to God's word together. Let's pray. Our gracious Father, uh, you know that at certain times our hearts are heavy, and we wonder where can we turn when we are overwhelmed or when we are afraid, when we're concerned about what's going on around us, or when we are concerned what's going on even within us, Lord. We we just don't do a very good job of ruling ourselves. But we thank you, Lord, that you have made us and that you are the high king of heaven. So enable us to bow before you and enable all of, all of the authorities in this world to bow before you. Cause them, Lord, to bow and bend the knee and acknowledge your authority. But, Lord, let it begin with us in this place, in this moment. Uh, let us acknowledge you as our God, our high king. Um, let us acknowledge your word as being our law and uh, our duty and our responsibility and our calling. Um, and, Lord, give us grace. Give us grace to hear you, to know you, to love you. 
and send the power of your spirit upon your word to transform us so that we can love you more and more, so that we can love our neighbors more and more, and so fulfill your calling upon our lives. Lord, remove other distractions. Help us turn our attention to you, for it is in Christ alone that we find our hope and our salvation. So, Lord, let us receive these blessings from you as we sit together under your word, for we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. So, I read for you this morning from Genesis chapter 23, beginning in verse 1. Hear the word of God. Sarah lived 127 years. These were the years of the life of Sarah. And Sarah died at Kiriath Arba, that is Hebron, in the land of Canaan. And Abraham, Abraham went in to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. And Abraham rose up from before his dead and said to the Hittites, I am a sojourner and foreigner among you. Give me property among you for a burying place, that I may bury my dead out of my sight. The Hittites answered Abraham, Hear us, my lord, you are a prince of God among us. Bury your dead in the choicest of our tombs. None of us will withhold from you his tomb to hinder you from burying your dead. Abraham rose and bowed to the Hittites, the people of the land. And he said to them, If you are willing that I should bury my dead out of my sight, hear me and entreat for me Ephron, the son of Zohar, that he may give me the cave of Machpelah, that which he owns. It is at the end of his field. For the full price let him give it, me, give it to me in your presence as property for a burying place. Now Ephron was sitting among the Hittites, and Ephron the Hittite answered Abraham in the hearing of the Hittites, of all who went in at the gate of his city. No, my lord, hear me, I give you the field, and I give you the cave that is in it. In the sight of the sons of my people I give it to you, bury your dead. Then Abraham bowed down before the people of the land, and he said to Ephron in the hearing of all the people of the land, but if you will, hear me, I give the price of the field. Accept it from me, that I may bury my dead there. Ephron answered Abraham, My lord, listen to me. A piece of land worth 400 shekels of silver, what is that between you and me? Bury your dead. Abraham listened to Ephron, and Abraham weighed out for Ephron the silver that he had named in the hearing of the Hittites, 400 shekels of silver, according to the weights current among the merchants. So the field of Ephron uh, in Machpelah, which was to the east of Mamre, the field with the cave that was in it, and all the trees that were in the field throughout its whole area, was made over to Abraham as a possession in the presence of the Hittites before all who went in at the gate of his city. After that, this, Abraham buried Sarah, his wife, in the cave of the field at Machpelah, east of Mamre, that is Hebron, in the land of Canaan. The field and the cave that is in it were made over to Abraham as property for a burying place by the Hittites. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We return now to our study of the book of Genesis. We left off during Advent and Christmas. Now I'm going back to Genesis. And this passage is a transitional passage. We are moving from the story of Abraham and beginning the story of his descendants. So there is not a lot that is going on here, but it does move the story forward. And we remember last, year, last week when we were talking about the importance of reading Scripture, that all Scripture is inspired by God. It is breathed out by God and profitable for us, including this passage. And here's how I think we can profit from this passage today. I think in this short chapter we see how faith in God and His promises enable us to grieve 
and to live in hope. That's what we'll see here, I think, in Abraham as he goes through this very human uh, episode uh, that I think we can identify with on, on several levels. Sarah has died. And this is a painful loss for Abraham and his family. It's not unexpected. He, she lived 127 full years. She and Abraham were together in a bold and courageous journey of faith. Uh, together they trusted in God and left everything behind and went to a new land that God was going to show them. Together they trusted God for a promised child, even knowing that she was barren, because God had promised them a people and a place. And so they trusted all those years together, and they, they went through hard times. And they were not always good to each other, and they were not always faithful to God. They were sinful people. But God united them together and blessed them together. And the death of a loved one is painful. Abraham mourns and weeps for her in a very human way. When we mourn, we mourn the loss of what we had with someone and also the loss of what we still might have shared with that person. Sarah had seen much, but she was never able to see the fulfillment of God's promise of a nation. God said that he would give them a people and a place, descendants and a land. And they had begun to see the descendants, hadn't they? They received this baby boy, Isaac, now, who would be the child of the promise, the inheritor of the covenant. But she did not see the land. Abraham did not even have a place to bury his wife. And think about it. Abraham was an immensely rich and powerful man. He had come out of Egypt with, with riches and livestock. He was the one who, who won the battle of the nine armies and the respective people all over. But he didn't have a square foot of property call, to call his own. Not, a, not an inch of land in his own name. So Abraham negotiates to buy the land, and it's really a fascinating look. We can look at some of the intricacies on Wednesday night and at Bible study, but uh, quite a, a, a conversation and, and commerce that is going here and, and a, a picture of ancient Middle Eastern customs. But we notice Abraham describes him, rightly so. He is a sojourner and a foreigner. He is a rich and powerful man, greatly respected. He was regarded by the people as a prince of God among us. Isn't that something to be known for? That's, that, that's quite a reputation. Most of us would not earn that kind of reputation. People would say he is a prince of God among us. But that's what they said of Abraham. Even so, he is just a sojourner and a foreigner. And so he has to negotiate with the people who possess the land for a burial place. And they're quite willing to give Abraham space in their tombs. They like Abraham. They're even willing to share their land with Abraham. They have been doing so and we're glad to do so for, for a burial place but they are a little reluctant to sell it to Abraham. When you have a, a, a foreigner who comes in and a sojourner come in, that remains their status. 
And you can keep them at bay and manage them a little bit, but once they become landowners, they become stake owners, they become a part of your community in a more substantial way. And they are reluctant to do that. And Abraham is reluctant to settle for anything else. Even when they offer a gift, Abraham doesn't want to receive it as a gift. He wants to pay for it, and he wants to pay full price for it. Gifts can be rescinded. And uh, if he pays full price for it, then he is not uh, owing anything to anyone. He is not under any obligation. There are no strings attached. So I love this. Uh, he makes this offer, and nobody bites on it, right? Uh, it's like a general volunteer. Nobody raises their hand. So he calls out Ephrod. And I, how about Ephrod? He <laughs> said, what? You say you want to buy my land? And, and, and they make the negotiation, and he buys the land, agrees to a sum. It might be a high sum. It's a little hard to tell. Um, because of records of the day, but it might have been a very high sum. Certainly Ephron had a strategic um, bargaining position. But Abraham buys it and buries Sarah in that land, in the land of Canaan, in the land that God has promised to him. And that is very important. Death makes us wonder about our future, about eternal life. And what about these promises of God? God had promised in the old covenant, God promised a people in a place, and that was a mighty nation of Abraham uh, and a land. In the new covenant, God still promises a people in a place, only, only now the people are the people of God in the church. And the the promised place is God's eternal kingdom. It is heaven. But we wonder, and death makes us wonder, will we see it? And will our loved ones see it? Jesus promised us that if we believe and trust in him, we will enter into that place that he has prepared. But we must be clean. We must be holy in order to enter into God's holy house and to live there forever. So Jesus does for us what we cannot do for ourselves, and Jesus makes us clean. He pays the penalty for our sins and pardons our guilt, and he validates that work, his promise and his power, through his own resurrection. So Jesus says, for example, in John chapter 6, For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. That's our promise. And that's why we can grieve with hope. Abraham did not have that promise, but he had the forerunner of that promise, this promise of the people and the place. And Abraham believed in that promise. And so he could grieve and he could go on living with hope. The Thessalonians were starting to wrestle with that. And Alan read our New Testament passage. I, I chose it because the Thessalonians were starting to wonder. wonder. Jesus, said that, Jesus said, I'll come back and I will take you to be with me. And Jesus ascended into the heaven and left this world in the body. Uh, and he hadn't come back yet, and it had been a little while, and some of our loved ones have died. What's going to happen to them? And so the Word teaches us, we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep. That means died that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord that we who are alive and are left until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. 
all those who died in the faith will enter into God's promise. So Abraham is able to bury Sarah in faith in the promised land. Faith enables us to grieve and to live with hope. And it is an act of faith in Almighty God that Abraham buries Sarah, buys the land, and buries Sarah there. If there was ever a time when it seemed like a good idea to give up and to go back home, this would be it. Abraham has no ties in the land. He has put down no roots in the land. He is fabulously wealthy, but all of his wealth is liquid. It's all transportable. And now Sarah has died, and it could have seemed like the perfect time. Look, it, it, it's been a good run, and God has blessed us here, but we're going to go back to our families. We're going to go back to the land we left. There's lots of burial places in the family right there. Sarah can be buried with her uh, ancestors and uh, plenty of places. I won't have to negotiate one moment from the next with the people who are in this land. He could have gone back home, but he doesn't. Abraham puts down roots in the land God said he would give to him. He says, this is where I am staying. I am believing in God's promise. It will come to pass. Sarah never saw it. Abraham never saw it before he died. In fact, if I did the math right, it would be about 600 years before the children of Abraham would finally possess the land. And they would come out of centuries of captivity in Egypt and finally take possession of the land promised by God. So this is a promise given to Abraham that he doesn't see, but he lives by it. And we have not seen the hope of heaven yet, have we? But it is promised to us. And we live by it. And we die by it. And we grieve in that promise. We will enter our home. And we put down roots in God's kingdom. And we can't buy a parcel of land in heaven. But we we put our roots down by putting our faith in the death and resurrection of Jesus and by holding fast to him in chaotic times and not putting our hopes and efforts into the comforts and pleasures and securities of this world, but trusting in God to secure for us everlasting joy. Hear me, brothers and sisters, this does not mean that we are indifferent to this life. God made the garden and put us in it to tend the garden. We have a job to do while we are here. We are called to be salt and light, to be faithful stewards, to love our neighbors in word and in deed, to seek the peace and the prosperity of our communities. And I think we're called to be good patriots as well. We remember that like Abraham, we are sojourners and foreigners in this world, and our inheritance is kept safe for us in heaven. And as I pondered this chapter, I thought of a, of a chapter in uh, Hebrews chapter 11, the so-called roll call of faith, which talks about Abraham and Sarah and how they had hold, held fast to their faith in God. They're talking about Abraham and Sarah uh, in Hebrews 11. These, we read in Scripture, these all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar, and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. 
For people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had opportunity return, to return. But as it is, they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. God is not ashamed to be called our God. When we put our trust in his son Jesus, that trust is not in vain. And he has prepared for you and for me a city. And we remember that. We remember that when we live in a certain sense as sojourners and exiles in this land. When we mourn, when we suffer losses, when our hearts are heavy and burdened. Grieve and live with hope. Let us pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we need to cling to you and our faith. We need our faith in times of grief and to enable us to live with hope in these days which are sometimes hard and painful. Lord, we grieve and mourn for loss of loved ones and even the, the inability to, to grieve and mourn the way we, we are accustomed to because gathering is so hard. Lord, we mourn for our nation that is not only in the grips of a pandemic but in the grips of this wave of indignant anger. Lord, we pray for peace and for the grace to seek peace, to be peacemakers. Lord, we pray for our leaders that you would cause them to lead in righteousness. And we pray that you will give strength to your church and show us how to be salt and light and witness to the eternal kingdom of God. Lord, would you give us passion without unrighteous hatred? Would you give us love and respect for others who were made in your image? And Lord, help us to live faithfully as good stewards in this world and to put down roots in heaven and to long for that city. Lord, give us a clear vision of the future that you have laid up for us so that we can be unshaken in our faith in these days. Lord, we pray for those who are crying out to you for help. We pray that you would be with Jeff as he recovers from his surgery, his toe removed. Lord, we pray for our brothers and sisters who are living in places of persecution and even martyrdom. Lord, theirs is a tough calling to live by faith as they grieve and live in persecution. Lord, we pray also for for loved ones who are battling with COVID, most of us know people now who, who have uh, tested positive. And we pray, Lord, that symptoms would be light and pass quickly. We pray that you would protect those who have not contracted the disease, that the vaccinations would be effective, that this scourge would be finally driven away. And as we wait, Lord, do not uh, let us be overwhelmed or to despair, but to continue to trust in you and to live not, sim with gri not simply with grim determination, but Lord, by your grace, enable us to live with joy, for this is, this is the life to which you have called us. Father, we 
pray for joyful celebrations like Neil's birthday, and Lord, for many blessings that you've given to us for, for children like Isabella, for the, for the joy of, of seeing, seeing children on uh, the screen here. Um, Lord, these children are precious to us and to you, and watch over them. And Lord, watch over your children everywhere. We pray for the Mosaic churches as they're planning to, to have this joint worship service. And Lord, uh, anoint that time on Saturday when they gather in this sanctuary and work together to put together a video that will lead congregations in worship. Be with those. And, and Lord, we pray, we pray especially for New Abbey. We pray for our brothers and sisters there. We pray for times of refreshment for, for Pastor E.J. As, as he begins a, a period of sabbatical. And Lord, we pray that you would bring restoration to him. And thank you, Lord, for the spirit which breathes life. Breathe life into all of us now, Lord. Give us confidence knowing that you love us and that you hear us when we pray even as we pray now, as Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, I am grateful that you have been able to join with us now and receive God's benediction now as you go into the rest of your day and into your week. Go forth under the grace and the mercy and the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ. And may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Thank you all for zooming in. Good to see you. Hi, Barbara. Barb Good morning, Sherry. Alan, thanks for reading. Oh, you're welcome.